All right, this week I want to talk to you about how God feels about the lost dead. Now, there was a video that I did some research on uh, this for my devil possession and the eyes um, study. This guy named Doe, uh, he's a dodo head. Uh, he was the head of the Heaven Gate, Heaven's Gate uh, cult thing. And he, you know, was a crazy nut and he claimed to be Jesus Christ and he caused a lot of people to die. And so I put a comment on the video and I said, I have it right here, I'll put it up on screen. It is a pleasure to know that this devil is frying in hell right now. And it's gone and I keep seeing people replying and replying and replying and replying. 58 replies as of this sermon here, putting the sermon together. And, you know, people are all upset, you know, why would a Christian make a statement like that? And they're qu quoting scriptures at me and stuff. And, and so we're going to look at these scriptures. So turn first in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. This is one of the ones that they'll use to say that it was wrong of me to say that statement. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Okay. It says here, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Okay, next we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. See, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Okay, Ezekiel 33, verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Okay, so you see it there again. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Next go to Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. We're going to go to verse uh, 32. It says here, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. So you see, very plainly, it was wrong of me to say that uh, this dough guy, it's a pleasure to know that he's burning in hell right now. That was wrong of me because, after all, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The Bible plainly teaches that. And here you have this, and, and you know, if, if you're watching this video and you're one of these people that, that commented, please take this as a scriptural loving rebuke of you. Right? I'm not attacking you personally or trying to put you down, say you're lost and whatever else. Take this as a loving rebuke. This guy here, Lisandro Perez, says the Lord takes no pleasure on the wicked when they are cast into hell. It's sort of like a dry tree with no fruit, a waste of space. Now, do we just read that in the Bible? The Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked? Well, yeah, basically. We'll be getting back to that in a minute. Then this guy here, Grimma 333, I had to put a little bit of uh, blacking out here. It says, you bleeping psychopath. No one deserves to burn in hell, not even Joseph, Stalin, or Mao. By the way, bleep the God of Christianity and Islam. And it's always funny when these stupid atheists do this. They say, you know, they'll cuss about the God of Christianity. Well, uh, I have to actually agree with him on that. You say, what? What are you talking about? Look at how it's spelled. Lowercase g. So the lowercase g in Christianity, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Who is the God of Christianity? Lowercase g. Satan. He's not God the Father, capital G. He's a lowercase g God. So the system of Christianity, when we talk about lowercase g God, it's a reference to Satan. So yeah, I am against that Satan. Now, I wouldn't use profanity like that, but I am against the lowercase g of Christianity. So if you're an atheist and you say, I hate the God of Christianity, and you're spelling lowercase g, amen. Praise the Lord. I agree with you. I hate the lowercase g of God of uh, Christianity as well. The uppercase g, that's a different story. I'm his servant. Now you have down here, Shunkawakin Oka Oka Winka, whatever. We Christians aren't all like that. Speaking about me, you know. The Christ I serve specifically said he wished that none should perish and came to show grace and love even for men like this and Stalin and Hitler. So, you know, he wished that none should perish. Now, didn't we read that right there in the 
scriptures that we just looked at? Well, sure we read it. But did we leave anything out? Like these commenters did. Uh, yeah, they left some things out. So let's go back and actually see what the passage really says. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 31 through 32. Says here, Cast away from all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves, turn yourselves, and live ye. What is turning yourself in the Bible? Repentance. What have I been preaching for years and years and years now, and people get all upset at me, ain't teaching our salvation? Repentance to God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance to God. Turning from your wicked ways. Coming to God as a broken sinner and saying, my life is in your hands, you have control of it. Did Hitler do that? No. Did Stalin do that? No. Did Doe, this crazy leader of Heaven's Gate cult, did he do that? No. Did all three of those men understand who Jesus was? Yes. They all did. None of those three men could say, I never heard of Jesus Christ. I've Bible? I never heard of any of that stuff. All three men knew about Jesus Christ. All three men knew what it meant to be saved. All three of them. Stalin forbid Christianity under his communistic system. Hitler used Roman Catholicism and specifically the Jesuit order to structure his satanic government that he had. He knew what the Bible said. And this idiot uh, Doe guy, the head leader of the Heaven's Gate cult, he claimed to be Jesus Christ. See, so don't tell me, oh, these poor guys, oh, God loves them and he wishes that they would have gotten saved. God, when he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, it's always tied to, but that the wicked turn from his evil way. God doesn't say, I'm going to have pleasure in people that just never knew, and I'm just going to kill them, and I have pleasure in that. God doesn't sit up in heaven and go, <laughs> look at this, look at those little babies being aborted. <laughs> That's not God. Why? Those babies have no say in the matter. They're being murdered into the millions of, of babies every year. They have no say in that matter. God takes no pleasure in that. You know? And even you get some little child, it's a wicked little child, but they've not re reached the age of accountability. They're killed in a car accident or something. God takes no pleasure in that. But when you have wicked, Christ-rejecting sinners, and they thumb their nose at God, and they say, don't you tell me how to live. I hate the Bible. Get that stupid book out of my face. I don't even want to hear about this Jesus Christ. Those people don't fall under that system. God says, okay, you're my creature. You're my creation. I want you to turn from that wickedness, but if you don't, I'm going to kill you. And we're going to see about that in this study. Turn next to Ezekiel chapter 33. And again, brethren, the old saying, a text without a context is a pretext. Don't let these people, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What's the rest of the verse say? It's kind of like people that say, God hath made of all nations of one blood for to dwell upon the earth. So then all the kindreds are the same. Uh, no, because you're supposed to keep reading, quoting the verse there in Acts chapter 17. And hath set the bounds of their habitation. Their proper boundaries in the Bible. Just like this thing of people only quoting part of the verses here that we're re reading today in Ezekiel and over in 2 Peter. They only quote part of it to line up with their beliefs. Let's actually see what this verse says here. Ezekiel 33, verse 10. Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? They're understanding that they're sinners. 
and they're understanding that their sin is destroying them. When the Bible talks about pining away, it means that you're getting sicker and you're getting thinner and you are dying a slow death. I remember this one time, just to tell you a little story here, just to kind of illustrate my point. I was at this gun range at one time. And this truck pulls in, and these two guys get out, and this one guy's a skinny little old man, and he's got long hair and a ponytail and a big white beard. And he's and he's standing there and he's going. <gasps> like that at first I didn't know where it was coming from I'm thinking what what is this sound and I realized this guy and a little while later pulls out a cigarette and I thought you poor creature you here this guy has emphysema his lungs barely even work anymore, and yet he can't give up the sin of smoking. You say, what was that, Brian? He was pining away because of his sin. That poor guy, he's probably dead by now. I have no idea. Amazing. And I've seen that. I've seen these people, you know, skinny, scrawny, little old people, just sinning all their lives, messing around, messing around, messing around. You know, don't say, well, not all old people that are skinny are dying from sin. I know that. I know that. But I'm saying, you see somebody that's in a hospital bed, they're dying from cancer, they're dying from a life of sin. They're pining away. And they need to understand it's their sin that calls that. Let's get back to the text here. Verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Turn. You know, there's an old, old saying, an old street preaching uh, slogan that's used a lot. Turn or burn, repent or perish. Yeah. Oh, I can get saved, I can become a Christian and just continue in my sin. No, you can't. Yes, I can. I can just believe, I'll believe and, and just be a carnal Christian. Uh, no, that doesn't work. You say, well, then I have to be sinlessly perfect. No, that doesn't work either. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You're going to sin, you're going to struggle with sin. But the point is, God can come into your life and he can tell you what you need to clean up and what you need to get rid of. So when you have these people that say, don't talk to me about Jesus Christ. I don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. And I've seen that, you know, been out witnessing and stuff like that. And you go to talk to one of these people that's pining away in their sin. And you say, I'm here today to talk to you about the Lord. Don't, uh, no, you know what? I don't even want to talk about that. Okay, you have your beliefs and I respect your beliefs. But don't talk to me about Jesus Christ. I don't want to hear it. They're pining away. They're dying slowly, and you come and you say, you need to turn from that. You need to turn to Jesus Christ. He can save you. He can save you from this life, but you can't continue in that life. You're a drunkard. You're a fornicator. You're a pornographer. You're whatever. You have to quit. You have to quit. Don't talk to me about that. When you get somebody that rejects Jesus Christ like that and openly says, don't you preach to me, Get that book out of my face. I'm not taking that gospel tract. We're going to see what God's real feelings are towards somebody like that. And especially when they die in that sin and they go to hell. We're going to see about that. Because really that's what this whole thing is about. People got upset at me because I ripped on this doe guy. I said he's a pleasure to know he's burning in hell right now. Why? He died without Jesus Christ. And murdered other people. Took other people with him calling himself Jesus Christ the whole time. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. I'm going to see the other one here that people try to quote. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to. There's that horrible word again that Brother Brian uses so much, and it's just, I get so sick and tired of hearing it, and blah, blah, blah. All should come to a belief, simple faith. 
Um, the word is repentance. Repentance. What does that mean, Brian? What's repentance mean? It means, you know, I remember uh, uh, Jack Hiles, which that guy is so wicked it's insane. I'm reading a book about him right now. I'm going to be talking about that in the future too. But Jack Hiles would say, repentance means turning from a state of unbelief to belief. <laughs> okay, then how does that work over there in the book of Acts where it says repentance towards God and belief in our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, how does that work? Belief in God, belief in Jesus? No, repentance means turning from that life of sin. Not before you get saved. Not before you, you, know, you have to clean up everything and then you get saved and stuff later. No, 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 no. That's Lordship salvation. Coming to God and saying, those sins that I did in my past, those are evil, those are wicked. I need to get saved. That's true biblical salvation. Verse 10 through 12. We're going to see about this thing of the loving God. Okay? But, as the day, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Hmm. That doesn't sound too loving to me. I mean, look at this beautiful scenery here around me. Look at the beautiful trees there. Look at the water and the, all this beautiful stuff here around me. And God's going to burn it all up? Everything? The whole world? All the seven wonders of the world and all the ancient things and all the museums and all the antiques and all the, all the history that we have? It's all going to be burned? Yeah, uh-huh. You say, that seems kind of strange. Why would a loving God do a thing like that? A loving God didn't make this for eternity. He made this earth to be subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Everything breaks down. Everything gets worse with time, not better. This is an eternity that you see around me here. That people might say, that looks like heaven. This isn't nothing but a dung heap compared to heaven. Okay? Heaven is so far beyond this. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Paul wrote about that. We haven't even seen the glory of heaven yet. As beautiful, I'll grant you, this is beautiful here, but heaven's better. You say, I just don't want to give up the world though. I just can't turn to God. I don't want to give up the world for what he has to offer. You're insane. You better repent. You better turn to the Lord. Anybody, I don't care how good a health you are in, you are pining away here on this earth. Why? We're all subject to the second law of thermodynamics. We all fall apart. We all get more unhealthy. You get more wrinkles. You get more health problems. You get more tired. You get, you know, all this stuff. It all falls apart. So why? Because that's how God designed this earth to be. And eventually he burns the whole thing up. So seeing then that all this stuff is going to be dissolved, all this, why are you fighting for this? Why are you trying to keep it? it doesn't make any sense. This isn't it. Look at verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. You know, one of the reasons people try to find contradictions in the Bible, a lot of these atheistic fools and things, they try to find contradictions because they don't want to accept the fact that this book condemns them as sinners. What does an atheist have? What is their heaven? This. Right here. This is all an atheist has. This life is it. What a miserable existence. And they're unstable and unlearned. The Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. They are foolish. 
And so they try to wrest the scriptures. They try to make the scriptures contradict so that they can overthrow the authority of the Bible. But look what happens when you as a Christian start to get suckered in by that. Verse 17. Ye therefore, so he's talking about lost people in verse 16. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. We serve a holy, righteous God, brethren. And our God is a consuming fire. Our God is the judge of the universe. And if you mess around with that judge, his wrath will fall upon you. We're going to see that in this study. You better be careful. You better get right. You better get saved. And you say, but, but I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about this God, this vengeful God of the Old Testament. You know, you'll hear that. Um, then you're being led away with the error of the wicked. Don't be afraid of these atheistic fools out there. They're trying to say that this is hate speech. It is hate speech to them. God's not pleased with them. His wrath is coming upon them. I'm going to show you, that, show you that in this study. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. What about the loving Jesus? Well, well, I don't like the God of the Old Testament, but I sure love Jesus. He's a nice guy, you know. Jesus wouldn't do anything bad, would he? I saw a comment the other day. Some guy said, uh, you do realize that Jesus never spoke about hell, don't you? Well, we're going to see about that. You know, Jesus is our buddy. He's our friend. Jesus is the teddy bear and God's the big bully. You know. Matthew chapter 10 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You say, well, see, Jesus is warning about this bad, bad boogeyman named God the Father. Uh, news flash for you here, friend. Jesus is God the Father. You say, well, why wouldn't he say then, fear me that has both... Why? Because Jesus is on the earth right there as a mortal man in a mortal corruptible body. He didn't sin, but he's there in corruptible flesh. He's outside of eternity. And eternity is where God the Father, the soul of the Godhead, he's up there. So God can see, he, he can see things and know things. Whereas a lot of that stuff was hid from the Lord while he was here on the earth. Why? Because he had to walk and talk and be a man while he was here on the earth. That's why he's saying, hey, fear God. And Jesus is making it very plain that, uh, and we're going to see this as we continue. He's the one that's casting people into hell in Matthew chapter 25. We'll be going there, so just be patient. Jesus is making it very plain. The God of the Old Testament is the God that still exists today. You say, that cruel God of the Old Testament, he's still around? Uh, yeah. In fact, his cruelty hasn't even reached its height yet. So I don't know if I can believe in a God like that. Okay, then over in the book of Hebrews, it says that if you are without ch out chastisement, then you're a bastard. A bastard is somebody that is a child that doesn't know their father. I hope that you're not a Christian that doesn't know your father. Professing Christian. But uh, next let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. Matthew 5, verse 29. says here, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Uh, that doesn't sound very loving. That's kind of funny because the, the ridiculous JWs will be like, Hell is the grave! Well, everybody goes to the grave. Other than the rapture, the, the raptured saints, and you know, you have Enoch and Elijah that went up. But everybody else goes to the grave. Why would it be better than to cut off, pluck out your right eye, cut off your hand, you know, whatever? Why would it be better to do that than to go to the grave? Uh, Jesus isn't talking about the grave there in Matthew chapter 5. It's funny too because all these one-worlders say, let's go to the Sermon on the Mount. I like the Sermon on the Mount because it doesn't mention the blood of Jesus, you know. Let's go to the Sermon on the Mount. 
How about those verses in the Sermon on the Mount? They avoid those, don't they? Oh yeah. New Agers don't like stuff like that. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. Okay, it says here, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Hmm. Separating people? That doesn't sound like unity. That doesn't sound like let's all come together and put aside our differences. No, He's going to separate the nations. And uh, it happens on the earth. You mean to tell me Jesus Christ is actually going to come down here and judge people? Yeah. And we're going to see what He does. What you're uh, loving Jesus. A lot of people think that Jesus is this loving guy. Let's see what He does. Matthew chapter 25 verse 41. Then shall He say also unto them on the left hand, the goats, there, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, I'm just so glad. God loves the sinner but hates the sin. God loves you. God's love for you is unconditional, friend. Really? Is that his love? When he says, uh, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, when you love something, you don't usually call it cursed. And you don't send it down there to burn forever and ever. You see, back when the Lord was saying, fear Him which is able to cast both body and soul into hell. Hey, you'd be better to pluck out your eye, cut off your hand, than go to hell. You say, well, he's warning about God the Father. Yeah, but he comes back, Matthew chapter 25, and he's casting the people down there. So who is Jesus? Jesus is God the Father. And if you say, I accept Jesus, I believe in Jesus, but I sure don't like the God of the Old Testament, you don't know Jesus. You're not aware of what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do when he comes back. Okay? Next, we're going to go to... Uh, Matthew 23, verse 33. One of the most amazing statements. Let me check something here quick. Okay, battery power is starting to get a little bit low. See if I can make it through this. Matthew 23, verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Why would Jesus ask a question like that? How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Didn't he know? You say, well, of course Jesus knew how they could escape the damnation of hell. Then why didn't he tell them? He had told them, and they rejected. But wait a second, Jesus Christ is God. Why couldn't he say to them, mind, be changed? You mean to tell me the Lord will allow people to go to hell because they have a free will? Yeah. He would. And um, he didn't have much love for them either. Why? They had openly, firmly rejected his word. That's why. And if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're an atheist and you say, I reject the Bible, I reject Jesus Christ, I don't want to even hear about that stuff. God's love, God's love is not for you. His wrath is upon you. I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. Okay, Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Got to keep an eye on the battery now. I was trying to find a plug out here earlier, but I just can't seem to find one, so... Just kidding. Mark chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. 
and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater damnation. Greater damnation? Uh, is that love? The loving Jesus that loves unconditionally and never stops loving, loves the sinner, all the stuff? Is that love? Greater damnation? Hmm. Interesting. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Verse 16. You say, well, I didn't think you were going to go there because that's the verse I was going to go to to point out that how much God loves us. God so loved the world, you know. John 3, 16. Can't see the battery power from back there too good, so just had to check it out there on my little screen. John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's see what the Bible talks about here. John 3, 16 through verse 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's true. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? That's why God sent his Son. He didn't send him down here. I mean, God could have sent his Son down and said, Hey, anybody who's a sinner, kill him. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to die for our sins. You say, well then, he still loves me because I reject him. No, let's continue reading. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. If you really truly want to be saved, if you truly want to be right with God, then you're going to look for the light. You're going to want to have light poured on your life and have God judge you according to his word. But when you have people that say, I don't want that, don't talk to me about that stuff, don't talk to me about God, don't talk to me about the Bible, it's because they reject Jesus Christ. And as a result, God condemns them, both in this life and into eternity. He says, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you want to be part of that? So I'm willing to take my chances. I think that I might get out of it because God will understand I'm a good person, blah, blah. Okay, take your chances. See how that works out. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans 1 and verse 18. So I just don't know about this thing, Brian, this wrath stuff. I don't know about that. Let's read. Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they know, knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We're going to see here in a minute who, how the Bible defines a fool. But the fact of the matter is, the invisible things of the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That all happened by random chance? But the computer you're sitting in front of was created? That wasn't created, but your computer was. You're insane. You have mental problems if you truly believe that. You're crazy. You've lost it. Cuckoo. See? You're without excuse. You reject Jesus Christ. You hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you reject it. God's wrath is upon you. Not His love. Not His long-suffering gentleness and grace and mercy. His grace and mercy is that you're still breathing. Okay? You still have a chance to get saved. But at some point in time, that chance is gone. God's wrath abides on the children of disobedience. 
if you are here watching this video, you need to get saved. You need to get your life right with God. He owned you. He created you. He provided a way to be saved. If you reject Jesus Christ, His wrath is on you. It's just as simple as that. You say, well, you're a terrorist. No, I'm your best friend because I'm trying to warn you about it. The terrorist, the one who's a terrorist, the bad person, is the little sissy preachers out there and little new agers and whatever else that are telling you that God loves you. They're not your friend. I'm your friend because I'm giving you the scriptures to show you that God is against you and His wrath is upon you right now. You better get saved. And we're going to go to the Old Testament, but let me just pause here. Let me change my battery. I'll be right back with you. Okay? All right, we're back. Psalm 2. I'm going to go next to Psalm 2. We're going to see some more scriptures here to talk about how God feels about lost people. Psalm 2. A lot of these atheists are out there trying to say they're going to we're going to stop Christianity and all this other stuff. Sure you are. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. There's a point at which, you know, you can make a mock at sin. The Bible talks about fools make a mock at sin. There's a point at which you can mock the Lord, mock the Lord, mock the Lord, and plan against him and say, we ought to put these, all these Bible-believing Christians should be put into re-education camps, you know, like they did in communist countries. Open-minded atheism, you know, really tolerant of other people's beliefs, but, you know, that's the way history has been. Catholicism, atheism, all kind of goes back to the same system, but, you know, whatever. But the fact of the matter is, your plans against the Lord and against His anointed, God's laughing at them. God doesn't look down and go, Oh, I really wish they wouldn't do that because I love them so much. He looks down and He just goes, Uh-huh, okay. And He's going to mock you. We're going to see that here. But look at verse 11 and 12 there in Psalm 2. Verse 11, verse 12. Serve the Lord with Fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You see, right now God has a whole lot of grace, a whole lot of mercy. But you better get saved because that mercy is running out. And that time of Jacob's trouble which is coming is going to be very, very bad. We're going to talk about that here in just a couple minutes. Next go to Proverbs 1, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1 verse 7. He say, I, I get these people, you know, I'm an atheist. It's like, well, I'm sorry for you, you know, sorry to hear that. No, you need to respect me, I'm an atheist. Oh, well, here's what the Bible says about you. Proverbs 1, verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And the Bible goes on to say about the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. God calls you a fool. You say, well, uh, but I'm wise. Uh, if you are wise, the beginning of knowledge is fearing God. Understanding the guy that can make this, heaven and earth, uh, he's not somebody that you want to mess with, okay? You want to mock a guy like that? And the Bible says about Jesus Christ, and it says, by him all things consist. You can't take another step, you can't breathe another breath without God giving you permission. And you want to mock him, huh? And you think his love is upon you? You know, there's a lot of these wicked people right now that are mocking God and getting a big kick out of it, and they're saying, ah, look, nothing's happening, ha, 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 ha. I'll mock God, I'll mock Him, I'll make fun of Him, I'll laugh about God. What's He going to do? Hey, strike me down with lightning. Oh, it didn't happen. Ha, ha, ha. You know what God's doing? He's reserving those people for the time of Jacob's trouble. 
because his wrath is coming on, on this earth and it's going to be so horrible, so frightening. And the Bible talks about the mighty in that day are going to run away naked. They're going to be so scared. Special forces, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, Spitznuss, whoever, what are these special forces organizations? They're going to be running from the Lord naked. In the shower, here comes God. Ah, they run out through the woods ah, trying to get away. Scared to death. And that's your future if you're an atheist. If you make it to the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, most won't. But, uh, you know, a horrible thing. But you just keep telling yourself it's all fantasy. Keep telling yourself that. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. So I just, I think God still loves me though. I think, I think there's still some love there. And if there is a God, I'm sure he loves me. Let's look about that. Proverbs 1, 24 through 29. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. So he's not willing that they should perish. He's wanting them to turn. Verse 25, But ye have set it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. See? He's saying, hey, you're in sin. Don't talk to me about sin. I'll do what I want to do with my life. It's my life. They would none of his reproof. What does God do? Verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. You know what God's going to be doing up there in the time of Jacob's trouble? Pour out all this wrath and all this vengeance and people down there screaming and running and stuff like this. He's going to be up there going, <laughs> look at there, <laughs> look at that. You rejected me all those years, Bill Maher and uh, Richard Dawkins and all these other stupid atheists. And I'll call them stupid because look up the word stupid. It's in the dictionary. It's not a Bible word. Yes, I know that. Uh, Trinity is not a Bible word. Bible is not a Bible word. There's a lot of verses or a lot of words that aren't in the Bible. But I'm going to refer to certain people like that because I get a little bit sick and tired of them attacking Jesus Christ. Okay? I talk plainly. I talk bluntly. Whatever. The whole point is God's going to laugh. God's going to mock and as a Christian, you can get real embarrassed by that God. As a Christian, you can start to say, well, I, well maybe, maybe God will send some people to hell, but he's going to be crying when it happens. That's not the God of the Bible. Remember this statement. There's not one person in hell that doesn't deserve to be there. Anybody who has ever died in their sins and gone to hell deserves to be there. You say, well, we all deserve to be there. Not me. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I got to the point where my pride was lowered and I said, I'm a sinner. You say, well, don't your sins... Do yeah, my sins qualify me to go to hell, but I, I you know, got out of the thing because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And I used to mock the Lord. I used to mock the Bible. But I got to a point where my sin, I stopped my self-righteousness and my sin, I said, I'm out of this whole thing. I'm done. I want to trust Jesus Christ. And you don't want to give up your sin? And you think God's mercy is for you? Boy, you got a shock coming. Let's continue reading here. Verse 27. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Hmm. You say, well, I'm a Christian now, so I don't need to fear God. I can love God. God loves me. I have so much love in my heart. God loves me. I don't need to fear. There's nothing to fear. All this stuff. We're going to see about that too. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. What is your motivation for serving the Lord? Love. Well, I grant you, love has a part of it. 1 John chapter 4 talks about that. You know, charity, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's there. But what about uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11? Let's go to verse 10, actually, first. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Look at verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 
but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. The terror of the Lord? We persuade men? Uh, show me where it says, knowing therefore the love of God, we persuade men. Knowing therefore the charity of God, we persuade men. No, 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 no. God's love is not manifest on those who reject His Son. God has no charity for those people. God will be long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God will be gracious and merciful. But if you think God loves those lost people that reject His Son, you are deceived. Okay? His wrath abides on them. And you say, uh, well, you know, how should I, you know, I've been trying to tell my, my lost relatives about the love of God and how He loves them so much that He sent His only Son, only begotten Son to die for their sins and God loves you. Friend, won't you get saved and understand the love of God? Well, I grant you, maybe some people have been so beat up and, and ripped up in their life that the love of God is appealing. But I'll tell you a stronger motivation, the terror of the Lord. You say, terror of the Lord? I, terror? Is terror the right word? Well, what do we have in the future? Three sets of sevens. Seven seals, excuse me, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. What are the seven seals? I'm just going to give you a brief little synopsis of each one here. Because we, you know, we're not going to go over this. It'll be a whole other study. Seal number one, the Antichrist is unleashed. The world ruler. And he goes out conquering and to conquer. Number two, you have war, the red horse. Number three, you have famine, the black horse. Number five, you have the souls under the altar reminding God to take vengeance. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge and judge them that dwell on the earth? You know, talks about that. Number six, you have physical changes to the earth. Everything changes. Because, see, the seals overlap the other judgments. All right? It's not chronological. The seven uh, seals, the trumpets, the, the vials. I mean, it's, these things overlap somewhat. But uh, number seven, you have silence in heaven. There. Why? Because the trumpets are about to sound. What do you have with the trumpets? Hail mingled with fire and blood. That's the first trumpet. And a third of trees and all green grass is burned up. One third of all these trees... Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a forest fire, but they all have one thing in common. Flames. And you know what the flames produce? Smoke. You understand that? You say, well, come on. Of course I understand that. A third of all the trees, how much smoke is that going to create? I remember when I was back down in Pennsylvania, there were wildfires in Canada up above, you know, the, the part there of, you know, like New York and stuff up in that way, we could smell the smoke on a windy day in southeastern Pennsylvania. I was in Montana the one time up in the northwestern part, Yak, Montana. I had a brother that lived out there for a while. We were out there visiting him, and there was big forest fires miles away. At night you could see the sky glowing, and the air had smoke in it. You could smell, it's just like being in a, outside a wood stove, you know, and you could smell the smoke pouring down over you. You could smell the smoke. How about when a third of all the trees is burned up? That's God's love that's being manifest. Number two, the second trumpet. You have a burning mountain cast into the sea, and a third of all creatures dies in the sea. Except for the dolphins, because God will spare the dolphins because people believe that they're reincarnated spirit beings or something. Sure. Save the whales. <laughs> right. Number three, you have wormwood falls upon the waters and they become poisonous. Hmm. Number four, you have a third part of the sun, moon, and stars is darkened. Number five, locusts released to sting men and the pain lasts for five months. That's the love of God. Uh, no, it's His wrath. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. And by the way, it's funny because when these people in that time of Jacob's trouble, when they're being stung, they're blaspheming God. Hmm. Almost like they've been turned over to reprobate minds because they took the mark of the beast and they can't get saved. 
Number six, you have the 200 million man army is unleashed on the earth. The army of the Antichrist, the biggest army ever in history. Number seven, you, it announces, the seventh trumpet announces the third woe. Finally, you have the seven vile judgments. Number one, you have the noisome and grievous sore for those who took the mark. Number two, you have the sea becomes blood and every soul dies in the sea. Everything's dead. You know, the, the dolphins, the third part that had died there before, now they're all dead. Not a third, but three thirds, you know, all, 100%. Number three, you have rivers and fountains of waters become blood. It's that beautiful river right here behind me. Blood. You want to go through it? You say, why would this happen? I don't understand why it would happen. Because God's wrath is coming upon the world. And you say, why would a loving God do a thing like that? A loving God provided a way out. That's why I'm here warning you. I know therefore the terror of the Lord. Therefore, that's why I'm trying to persuade you to get saved. You better get saved. You don't want to face God's wrath. You know, I see these atheists all the time. They'll prove your God exists. You don't want that. You want to see physical proof that God exists? You don't want to do that. Oh, I think I'd like to see it. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Go on into the time of Jacob's trouble and get to see God's wrath. You're going to love it. Number four, the fourth vile judgment the sun scorches men with great heat and they continue to blaspheme god through it number five you have great darkness number six the euphrates river is dried up in preparation for the battle of armageddon and number seven you have a massive earthquake so massive that it flattens the mountains changes the whole planet you say where's mount everest everest see that plain over there that big flat area that's mount everest Huh? Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world? Mount Everest that used to stand there? Yeah, it's flat now. Huh? Why would that happen? Um, because God's mad and getting angrier by the day. You talk about terror. You talk about fear. You talk about horrible things to go through. It's going to be horrible. You have a chance to get out of it. Are you going to take that chance? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. Hebrews 10, 31. It says here, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you believe that, Christian? You say, well, I'm saved. I didn't talk about it for you. I'm talking about for the lost people. And the Bible, by the way, does say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Speaking to saved people. If you mess around with sin, God can punish you too. Now today, you aren't going to lose your salvation. But the fact of the matter is, God can punish you. You better keep that fear of the Lord. But you say... Um, but Brian, see, we're still back to this thing of you said that that guy is burning in hell and it's a great pleasure to know that he's burning in hell. That wasn't right of you to say that. You should not have said that it's right for somebody to be burning in hell. It's a pleasure to know that. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 3, verse 8. Romans 3, verse 8. Okay, it says here, And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil, that good may come. They're lying about him, saying that Paul is doing evil so that good can come. Now, what is Paul's reaction to that? Whose damnation is just. Paul doesn't say, Oh, I really have love for them. I really hope that they get saved. Oh, Poor thing, they're so innocent, they didn't know. He said, you're saying that about me? Then the fact that you're going to hell is just. 
you deserve to go to hell for saying a thing like that. Speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Don't tell me, well, that was Paul sinning there, and Paul was saying that, and he, should have, he shouldn't have said that. He should have had more love, and blah, blah, blah. Brethren, there are people out there that push the Lord to the extent where their damnation is just. This Bill Maher guy that I talked about in another video there, this atheist Christian rocker thingy, that Bill Maher guy, he hates Christians, he hates the Bible, he's going to damn a lot of people to hell. What do I think about him? His damnation is just. You say, uh, what do you think about some of these lost people? Well, Aleister Crowley bragged at raping and, and sexually molesting 150 boys in one year. Uh, what do I think about it? I'm glad he's in hell. I'm glad he's burning. You say, why? He had an opportunity to get saved. If I remember correctly, his dad was a Baptist minister. Back when Baptist meant something too, by the way. Not modern Baptist. You know? He had a chance to get saved. He rejected. Decided to serve Satan and be a very, very wicked, evil man. And his philosophies have gone on to damn millions and millions of people. His damnation is just. Let's continue here. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise. For we have both proved both or before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. They're pining away, in other words. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world is going to be guilty before God. They say, I reject that. I reject that belief of yours. That's your interpretation. I don't care. You're going to be guilty before God. And if you die in your sins, if you've watched this video and you go to hell, and this channel, you go to the main channel page, my main channel page, and right there is a salvation, takes, through, takes you through salvation message, takes you through all the scriptures, telling you how you can be saved. If you go to hell after watching this, your damnation is just. If you've rejected Jesus Christ, if you've thrown out gospel tracts, if you have family members that have been that are saved and tried to witness to you, your damnation is just. God's wrath is upon you. If you don't get saved before the rapture and you go into the time of Jacob's trouble, his wrath is coming upon you and it's just. You deserve it. You deserve it. We serve a holy and righteous God. Our God is a judge. And everybody comes into that judgment. I took the easy way out by having Jesus Christ as my advocate. As my lawyer, so to speak, if you will. He took my punishment on the cross so that I don't have to face the wrath of God. Now, I'll be punished as a son, chastened as a son, but I'm not ever going to have to face God's wrath. I don't want to face God's wrath. No way. You couldn't pay me to do that. There's not enough money, not enough women, not enough drugs, not enough whatever in this world. If I, if I had the choice of rejecting Jesus Christ, and I can't because I'm already saved, but if I had the, re the choice of giving up that personal relationship with Jesus Christ so that I could become a Hollywood celebrity, be the biggest celebrity, the biggest male celebrity in all of Hollywood, if I had that opportunity, I'd turn it down in a second. Heartbeat. I don't even need to think about it. You can have the world. Give me Jesus. There's nothing in this world that's worth me giving up Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, this Marshall Applewhite is the guy's name. I just want to say this in closing. Marshall Applewhite, the man that they called Doe, the founder of this Heaven's Gate cult. It was a total of 39 people that he killed by claiming to be Jesus Christ. 
You say, uh, have your beliefs changed on him, Brian? I mean, are you now saying that's, that you have mercy for him and that you really wish that he could have gotten saved and Jesus died for him? No, my feelings haven't changed. He's in hell. He deserves to be in hell. And I'm pleased with the fact that there is a judge that judges between saved and lost. And I know that these wicked people that have done these evil things are judged and under my feet in the center of the earth right now, burning, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. I take great pleasure in that. And if you understand the Bible, you would understand the same thing. Their damnation is just. How many times does it take before you get saved? I remember, I'll just tell you this little story in closing. I remember I had a sister the one time, and and uh, still have her. She's still my sister. But uh, I remember we were talking about this very subject, and I said about this guy deserves to be in hell, and she was like, "Well, I, you know, I'd I'd be careful with that. You know, it's I mean, you know, God died for everybody. He loves everybody, and blah 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 and stuff. And and my sister had a little baby daughter. That little baby daughter was there crawling around on her hands and knees, just a real little girl, maybe about a year old something like that, maybe a couple months old, not even a year old, whatever. And I said, uh, see that baby of yours? She said, well, yeah. And I said, uh, that guy that we were talking about there, this wicked sinner that's rejected Jesus Christ over and over again? Yeah. I said, would you allow your baby right there to be tortured to death for that man? Well, her eyes got big and she got kind of quiet and she's like, uh, I never really thought of it that way. And I said, yeah, think about it. Your child that you love is tortured to death for these wicked sinners. And when they hear about it, they laugh. What would be your reaction to that? Love or wrath? The wrath of God abideth on the children of disobedience. And this world can put so much pressure on you, Christian, to get you to back off on that truth. They can say, your God's hateful, your God's mean, your God's a murderer, and you start going, well, no, because uh, um, uh, the God of the Bible is just not in style. He's just not very neat. He doesn't manifest the love of the world. So you have to change things and you have to avoid the passages that say about the terror of the Lord and whose damnation is just and, you know, all these things, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The wrath of God abideth on the children of disobedience. He will laugh at them. He will mock them. You avoid those verses. And you find the verses that talk about God's love, you know, that's actually to the saved. And then you tell lost people that that love's for them too. They can reject that death, that horrible death that Jesus died, they can reject it and God can still love them. You're ashamed of the Word of God when you do that. I'm not saying you have to go around and be threatening people and doing whatever else. You know, we're not supposed to be terroristic. We're not supposed to violently try to convert people like Islam, Catholicism do. You know, but the fact is, brethren, we can't be ashamed of this book and the God in it. The God who wrote this book wrote those things down in the Old Testament and the New Testament too, by the way. Revelation's a whole lot worse than what the tribe or the nation of Israel was doing to those people back there in the Old Testament. Revelation's going to be much worse. Much worse. We can't be ashamed of the God of the Bible. Or He'll be ashamed of us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You, Lord, for saving me and for saving those that are, that are out there, that are Christians, I, I thank you, Lord, for saving us. I know you could have just wiped us out, Lord. You would, have been in, you would have been justified in wiping us all out. But because of your mercy, your long-suffering, your grace, you saved us. But Lord, I, I pray for those Christians out there that are constantly in the world and, and that are, are constantly browbeaten to, to be ashamed of you, Lord, to reject you and to say that, just kind of sweep you under the rug as an unfashionable furniture, so to speak. I just pray, Lord, that you would give us courage and boldness to stand up for you and your word and your standards in the midst of this very crooked and perverse generation. 
And uh, I just pray, Lord, for all those Christians out there that they would stand and not back down. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's going to be it for this sermon. Thank you very much for watching. And, and brethren, don't let these atheistic fools out there take you away from your belief in the King James Bible and your understanding that God is coming and that God's wrath is going to come down on this world. You know, when they say, your God's a murderer, well, not in the sense of premeditated murder and things like that of, of people and whatever. He, everybody gets a chance to get saved. But if you reject Jesus Christ, then yeah, God is going to kill you. And not just kill you, He's going to take you to a place where you're going to burn forever. You know, last week we read, about, or not last week, I'm thinking about my devotions actually last week. Um, you know, you can read about over there in the book of Luke about the rich man in hell. And he says, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool, just touch my tongue. Just one drop of water, that's all I ask. Look at all that water that back there. Not in hell. You say, uh, well, I think that God is just going to, you know, I'm just going to cry out to God. And I'm going to say, uh, God, can I just have some water? And he'll say, I, okay, all right, I'm sorry. I've, I have been a little bit rough on you. I'm sorry. Here's some water for you. No, he's not going to do that. You're down there. The Bible says it's outer darkness. The fire is described as brimstone. Brimstone is sulfur. When you burn sulfur, it produces an invisible flame. So there's not going to be any light down there. Pitch black darkness, burning, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth for eternity. That's why Jesus Christ said you'd be better to pluck your eye out if that's keeping you from getting saved. You'd better cut your hand off, cut your foot off. Do whatever you have to do to get out of hell. Whatever sin you are involved with, drop it. Nothing is worth it. Not one thing. You could be the greatest celebrity on earth, and if it means you going to hell, you'd be better to just quit it. Get out of that thing. You better get saved. You better get saved.